does that saying go? Six hundred only comes around once. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number six hundred of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My very special guest this week is an expert in the world of battery chemistry innovation, Dr. Bo Zhang. Did you know that Dr. Zhang was awarded the very first patent application for graphene back in 2002? And that patent was later recognized in the popular mechanics 15 Patents That Changed the World. Today, Dr. Zhang and I are discussing the biggest challenges facing EV batteries, the innovations Dr. Zhang believes are needed to help solve these issues, and how recent advancements in solid-state battery technology could be a game-changer for the future of electric vehicles. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Zhang to Fish Fry. Hi, Dr. Zhang. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Okay, so first off, tell me a bit about your educational background. And in 2019, you were elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors. Is that correct? Yes, um, that is correct. In uh, 2019, I had the honor of being named to the National Academy of Inventors Fellows Class, one of the highest professional distinction for academic inventors. Well, regarding my uh, educational background, I received both my master's and PhD in material science from MIT. My time at MIT helped to build a strong foundation for my career, which I have dedicated to uh, driving technological innovation, particularly within the field of advanced materials and battery technologies. After MIT, I serve as a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Material Engineering at Auburn University, Alabama, and also as head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota, and the Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science at Wright State University here in Dayton, Ohio. And along the way, I also was a Fulbright Scholar and visiting professor at University of Cambridge before moving to the uh, corporate world. Fantastic. Now, you filed the world's first patent application on graphene way back in 2002. So tell me about this patent and what drew you to graphene in the first place? Yes, this patent was filed in 2002 and uh, was titled narrow scale graphene plate. And that was for a new material composed of a single layer of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb structure, making it incredibly lightweight. Yet graphene as a new material is approximately 200 times stronger than steel. It has exceptional electron mobility and the highest thermal conductivity known to uh, physicist. I also currently hold over 200 graphene-related patents just for the interest of of your audience, perhaps, in addition to over 650 battery-related patents, so a total of almost 900 patents. So going back to the history about graphene, in early 2000 and 2001 or so, I was very interested in working to a develop some new material to replace a new material called carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube has very interesting properties. It has very high conductivity, high thermal conductivity, high strength, et cetera. However, it was at that time was just so difficult to produce in mass quantity and so, so expensive. So I told myself, perhaps we should try to develop some new material with comfortable or even better properties. And so that really led to my original attempt to calculate the property and estimate the potential of these materials called graphene, which is very similar to carbon nanotube in some way. 
And this material turns out to be a wonder material. And uh, the impact of this work has been recognized globally. And in 2012, a magazine called Popular Mechanics actually named this particular patent application as one of the 15 patents that changed the world. So we are very proud of uh, being the one who discovered or developed graphene as a new material. That's wonderful. So let's talk about the future of EVs, which depends greatly on innovation and battery technology. What do you see are the biggest challenges when it comes to battery technology for a mass adoption of electric vehicles? Yeah, right now, majority, practically 99% of the EV making use of the so-called lithium-ion batteries. There are several big challenges that impact the lithium-ion battery pack. And this includes, for example, battery safety. We, we know that Sometimes the uh, EV kind of cut fire or even has some uh, explosion issue. And this really was due to the use of the so-called liquid electrolyte that are flammable and explosive. And that is a major issue. The second issue is the cost, the battery cost. Uh, I mean, battery cost typically is amounts to about 40% of the total EV cost. So for consumers, uh, cost is a very sensitive issue, particularly for vehicle. The high battery cost, these amount of battery costs are due to the high cost of certain materials such as nickel, cobalt, and lithium, and also the complicated processes associated with the manufacturing of these batteries. That's really the second issue. The cost is a very important one. The third concern or issue is the so-called range anxiety. And sometimes if you drive the EV out, you don't know when this EV battery will last and uh, where can I find a charging station, etc. So there, there's some anxiety associated with that. And that type of anxiety issue really is uh, largely due to the long battery charging time. So even if I swing by and then uh, try to charge the battery. It may take half an hour or or one hour just to charge it up to 50-60% of the battery capacity. And in contrast, I think when we go into a gas station, it takes 5 to 10 or 15 minutes to finish the gas filling uh, process. And also, the current batteries, this amount of battery, still have relatively low energy density per unit weight or per unit volume. And a low energy density means a shorter driving range over, I mean, on one battery charge and the need to charge the EV battery frequently. So those are the issues. And um, now I think scientists or engineers are very interested in the so-called solid state batteries that have the potential to uh, resolve these issues of safety, low energy density and long charging time, et cetera. However, solid state battery also face some high production costs and complexity in commercialization. Well, despite these challenges, I believe that advancement in materials and processes could finally unlock the mass adoption of EVs. Along those lines, Beyond solid state battery innovation, what other innovations are needed to help solve these issues? You can either uh, improve the so-called anode material or cathode material. You can make use of the higher or develop higher capacity anode material or higher capacity cathode materials. And then along that line of thinking, it turns out that um, the solid state battery can provide you with much, much higher energy density. And so the next question would be, all right, so if solid state battery are this good, then um, why they are not on the market yet? There are quite a few issues uh, here. I think one of the issues here is that um, we normally would think that, oh, since this solid state battery appears to be a relatively new class of battery, so we may be in need of new equipment, new process, new facility, et cetera, in order to produce the solid state battery. So that is more like a 
misconception, in my opinion. And so what we are trying to do here is that what if we could use the existing process and equipment in the lithium-ion battery facility? And this lithium-ion battery technology has been on the market for 30 plus years already. So all the equipment, the processes are relatively mature. And then with that type of thought, our team here is already, um, we developed a new class of uh, electrolytes that we can follow exactly the same processes that you would use to produce the so-called lithium-ion battery. And then at the end, we can inject, for example, liquid electrolyte, and then uh, we find a way to convert the material, the so-called electrolyte, from liquid state to a solid state. That will then produce the so-called solid state battery without having to reinvent the wheel and to uh, develop new processes and equipment. I consider that to be a relatively uh, good accomplishment here. In addition, there's only so much space, for example, in the EV to accommodate batteries. So it it will be very important if we can find a way to uh, pack more battery. And then if the battery are relatively low cost, we can pack more battery, higher density battery into the limited space in chassis, for example, of a car. Also, along the way, we have developed some type of technology that we are able to directly pack the component together instead of into individual battery cell, like your double L, triple A cell, and then you connect all those individual cells with an electrical wire, connect them in a series. We directly arrange the so-called anal cathode solid state electrolyte layered together, et cetera, and then make them into the so-called module or pack instead of going into cell first and then connect a cell to form module and then connect modules to form a pack. So we have developed some very interesting technology that not only reduce the volume and the weight of the battery, also reduce the weight, and then it's actually make it a lot easier to manufacture the solid-state battery. Those are the kind of uh, innovation that we have um, come up with. And we believe that this really can solve all those issues that I have just uh, discussed um, earlier. Fantastic. Now, what does the future look like for you guys? Yes, we are basically right now at a battery materials company, in, in other words, that we our business model call for the production of some of the key material like the so-called high capacity anode, high capacity cathode, or next generation anode material that are more sustainable. So we have been working on the development of this type of anode material we call silicon anode material that has much, much higher capacity than graphite. Graphite is the material currently used in the so-called anode component of your lithium-ion battery right now. However, graphite can only store up to 350, 360 mini mR per gram, that type of capacity or specific capacity. However, silicon as a so-called charge storage material or lithium-ion storage material can store up to 3,800. Some people even think that 4,000 minimum hour per gram. So from anode perspective, you can store 10 times uh, more charges in this material. However, there are some technical issues associated with this. For example, if you squeeze a lot of a lithium ion into your silicon, silicon will get expanded. And then when you discharge your battery, silicon will shrink, expand again, shrink again, and after a huge cycle, the silicon will become broken into small pieces, et cetera. So there's a lot of technical issue. And we have solved all this problem here. And then we are ready to uh, scale up our production process of our uh, silicon anode material. We also have been working on some of the high capacity new type of battery, what we call lithium sulfur battery. In this case, the cathode site is based on the so called sulfur. And sulfur is kind of uh, relatively inexpensive, and it's everywhere. You can find sulfur anywhere in the world here. Even in the United States, there's plenty of sulfur, and they are very inexpensive. 
as opposed to some of the expensive material such as uh, cobalt. Cobalt is uh, being mined in some geopolitically unstable region. It is also quite expensive. And sulfur is relatively inexpensive, yet it has much, much higher capability to store uh, battery charges. So those are the kind of things that we have been developing. And then uh, we are here first to uh, scale up our silicon anode production facility. And then later on, may go into the production of high energy density battery cells for EV applications. That's exciting. Okay, so now it is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? <laughs> one meal? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. I would love to have um, the meal that my mom <laughs> used to cook for me. And those are the traditional Taiwanese cuisine. And uh, unfortunately, my mom just passed away uh, four months ago at the age of 93. So that's uh, that is what I'm missing the most. That is the most wonderful answer I have ever heard on my show. Oh, Thank you so much for joining me. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here. If you want even more information about Solid Ion or Dr. Bojang, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I completely understand. <laughs> you can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky social and mastodon too and we have a youtube channel youtube.com slash ee journal folks it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos including our very popular chalk talk webcast series and our new animated series called libby's lab and of course you can subscribe to our ee journal youtube channel as well also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of September 20th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.